A few weeks ago, you celebrated your uh, 65th birthday. How do you feel about this stage of your life? Yeah, that's uh, it's complex. But the short answer is uh, never felt more empowered in, in my music and in life. And, um, you know, the Bloom Ascension, that title of one of my more recent albums, I guess is the best way to describe what I'm feeling at this point in my life, is that the blooming of everything that I've put so much of my life and passion and desire into is just seems to be really you know unfolding at another level at 65 which is a number and um, at this point that represents uh, time here but in terms of you know having any kind of um, limitations on that besides um, when we'll be checking out you know with the final check out there but in the meantime uh, just never felt better felt really um, inspired and it's all just uh an exciting time in my life and somehow the music and my passion for that it just runs in my veins in a way that just feels like it keeps me healthy and focused and it's not a word that even happy you know can describe it's just a feeling of really of being um, completely nourished by you know what happens every day up till four minutes ago when I faded the uh, board down to call you here so so yes, 65 and thriving, feeling great. What still drives and motivates you to compose music after more than four decades of creativity? Well, part of it is my friends won't let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> Good friends. <laughs> yeah, Ron Sunsinger and uh, Steve Roach. Eric Wello is a new friend of mine. He and I had a long Skype yesterday for an hour and a half. You know, it's such a wonderful time now in terms of the technology that's involved. As things have evolved over the years, like going from the Serge, original Serge synthesizers and only having the three synthesizer companies, Serge, Buchla, and Moog, and everything being very expensive, to now having these amazing Eurorack modules, which dozens of little homegrown manufacturers are making these esoteric modules in their basements mm -hmm. that can do amazing things with music and sound. I mean, it's a whole different world than it was when I started. And I think the excitement from that keeps me going as well. Some of your albums sound like an invitation to explore territories hard to fathom or even tame. I must admit that I like more the luminous, radiant side of your work, but I see the darker part as equally essential when listening to your music. What's your approach to dark ambient? Well, I, I actually don't really have much interest in quote-unquote dark ambient, but, you know, in the sense that it became, you know, sort of like a slow-motion version of death metal or something. <laughs> When I look at other recordings that people sort into the dark ambient world, it has all sorts of aspects that I find childish, you know, like horror movie childish, kind of dystopian and satanic and all sorts of religious overtones and things. And, and I have very little interest in that stuff. What, what interests me is the poetry of existence. And I find that in order to feel fully alive, that in order to absolutely appreciate the magic of existence and the, the energy of life within one's own breath, that one has to acknowledge one's own mortality. One has to explore the shadows within oneself. And if we ignore those shadows, then they come up to haunt us. Then they become truly the monsters within our hearts. And so when I explore darkness, I do it in the same way that a poet does to bring it up to examine and to observe it as part of oneself. Just like in Buddhism, Gautama said that the main problem with suffering is that we ignore the reality of our own death and that in order to ease suffering one understands the nature of mortality there's nothing dark about it in fact to me it's part of the poetry of existence and the beauty of being alive is to recognize how very short that time is and to acknowledge the importance of the death of our loved ones and our own mortality Your style of playing guitar is subtle, very well integrated in the ambient textures. What's your approach to using guitars uh, regarding the technical and musical aspects? Actually, many of the sounds you hear that you think is synthesizer, it's played from a guitar. It took me a while to incorporate 
the guitar into an electronic landscape. I think it's to get that human touch the fingers and the strings and have that as a starting point for a sound. It, it, it makes the music more, more unique, you know, more personal. How would you describe your music to a person who hear for the first time what you are doing? <laughs> That's a, that's a tough one. I don't know that I can describe it uh, because it's meant to be experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do is if you like tribal drumming and kind of energized drumming and percussion and all of that, then you might be interested in listening to that. It's hard to explain. People say, well, what's a psychedelic experience like? Well, it's impossible to really articulate that. You only know when, uh, once you've experienced it. And so I like to think of, of the music in the same way. Experience the music. Don't just listen to the music, but experience the music, because that's what it's for. You either turn it on and get into it or turn it off. The tribal stuff and shamanic stuff is really meant to engage you in a way that's, that's deep into your soul. In your titles, you often refer to this notion of discipleship. Uh, it seems an important theme in your music, maybe in your life. What does it mean for you to be a disciple? Yeah, the Latin word, the root, just means the student. So I guess, I, in a sense, I became a disciple as a child because I realized there's another level of reality which is mystifying and awe-inspiring and very beautiful. And so I wanted to understand what that is. As a kid, I couldn't, obviously. But then later, when I became a sannyasin at the age of 21, 22 or so, and had already begun studying theology, I was convinced that I had experienced a dimension in this life and this existence that I would call sacred. And so I wanted to really study all the traditions to understand better what humanity had found about this particular dimension. And then with the addition of breath work and shamanic work, I more and more deeply penetrated this reality of existence and came to a point in my life where I would say, I, I know that this dimension is there. And so my desire had always been to become a disciple, a student of all these wisdom traditions. And I still consider myself a student in this. And, you know, when you're 62 and a half, which I am now, believe it or not, it's kind of crazy because, I mean, you know some things, right? Yeah. But what I don't know is so much more than what I know. Mm -hmm that I can never lose the feeling of learning more and being a disciple. And so that word, or rather the concept of approaching life and life's wisdom as a disciple makes the deepest sense to me. Before calling you, I just listened again to your new album with Craig Padilla, The Body Mantra. I enjoy this immersive harmonic meditation what was the concept leading up to this beautiful release? It's definitely a meditation, and you're in a meditative state while working on this music. It's also the connection between yoga and meditation, which are really one and the same. They're coming from the same place. So the mind, body, soul connection is, is really present while we're creating the music. That's what the music was about. And it's more about discovering not only ourselves inside, but also the connection from us internally to the external, to the world around us, or to the space or the studio that we're in, the instruments, all of it. Mm -hmm. The music represents that experience very clearly, and hence we, you know, we just really focused on trying to uh, present it in that way. Just said, hey, this is what this is about. It's really about the breath. It's really about being present. It's really about being in this sort of yogic state of mind. And hopefully when people listen to the music, they would also sort of feel that or, or be able to be teleported into that space. Much of your music has themes that concern space, the cosmic exploration, what significance have the cosmos in your work? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's one of those things that I hold a deep fascination for. I remember watching, I was in school as a, a very young boy. 
I was six years old when we sat in class and watched uh, the moon landing. And that held a very deep fascination for me. And I've, I've followed NASA ever since. And, and really the space programs of all countries, uh, especially today with uh, things that uh, China is doing in Japan and the Russians, of course, and, and SpaceX, you know, the, the private uh, sector here in the United States. Yeah, Elon Musk's company. Right. And so I see these photos and videos of all of the things that are happening in the research and our endeavors, you know, our, our desires to visit Mars, for instance, and just to peer into the universe and, and see what it's all about. And Most of your albums are conceptual. Each one feels like a whole story. What themes do you pursue? Yes, Marius, you're right. I like to find uh, topics that uh, interest me. It can be almost anything, such as the secret space program, which was very inspiring for me to dig deep into. It still is a very exciting team, and the music reflects a lot of this. The Precambrian was also interesting, but when I found the front cover picture for this album, I got inspiration from that picture. And this whole album was suddenly on a different level for me. I often uh, use picture as an inspiration and guide for my music. The Front Porch of Heaven is a wonderful work full of transportive moments. The title is mysterious and somehow make me think about a near-death experience or an epiphany. What's the story behind your new album? Well, in a certain way, it is kind of a near-death experience. I mean, not in that traditional sense, like I didn't actually die <laughs> during this experience. But the backstory on it is that last year in the spring, I found out that I was going to need open heart surgery. There were no symptoms or anything. It was just some tests that kind of led us down that road of finding out that I needed surgery. So this idea that I was going to have my heart stop for an hour during the surgery, it didn't really scare me as much as it inspired me. I just thought that is such a significant moment in your life, you know, to think that your heart will not be beating for an hour. So my imagination just kind of ran wild with the idea of, well, what's going to happen to me? You know, what happens when your heart is off? Like, are you, do you know? Is there some way that you're conscious of that? And if so, you know, would you go somewhere? Would I go somewhere mentally or, or spiritually? That was the inspiration for the music. And once I was home from the hospital and I was recovered, uh, then I just started making music about kind of what I imagined my journey was. That was kind of how it all began. It seems that sometimes you're trying to take the listener to deeper states of mind. Mm -hmm. And your music is very suitable for different forms of meditation. Thank you. Do you put any spiritual intention in your work? I'd like to think that everyone who composes any kind of music, that there is spirituality in there, even if that's something that's not a part of their life. I think that in the case of, of my work, at least, there's always a bit of quiet yet strong optimism. And yes, it's also balanced by some shadows. That's kind of where I like to be. I don't necessarily like music that skews really, really positive and happy, but I don't like music that gets dark and morose. I kind of like that middle ground, and I think that middle ground is where my spirituality probably is. That, yes, I, I accept that there are things wrong in this world, that there's some dark stuff, and yet there's still light, and it's up to me to not let it go out in my life. So that's kind of where those two meet in my music. <laughs> 